Welcome to the Think Tech Hawaii, the rule of law and the new abnormal. My name's Ben Davis. I'm sitting in as moderator today for the irrepressible Chuck Crumpton. And our topic of the day today is three part technology, technology, and more. Looking at some of the interesting things that have been developing in our world today. So I'd like to introduce our panelists for today. Um, first, there's Professor Vanilia Randall, who is the Emerita Professor of Law from the University of Dayton School of Law. And she is really the repository of the most amazing um, research uh, resource for uh, racism, race and the law at racism.org. And then we have with us also Daniel Rainey. Daniel Rainey used to be the chief of staff of the National Mediation Board. He is the uh, editor of the International Journal for Online Dispute Resolution and fellow of the uh, National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution at the University of Massachusetts. And so he's the, all things technology, um, he has been uh, involved for a long time with it. So welcome to you, uh, Professor Randall, and to Daniel. And uh, so our topic is technology, technology, and more. So let's turn you to you, uh, uh, Daniel, a little bit. You know, last five months or so, I've seen so much talk about chat GPT and AI, and it's going to change the world and all this stuff. And, uh, you know, is this technology, technology, what would you call it? Well, I think your term technology is, is pretty applicable, really. Um, you know, it's, I think there are three levels that people are um, worried about, freaked out about, really, in terms of the use of AI. Uh, on the very top level, it's that AI is going to be smarter than we are, and uh, it's going to cause all sorts of damage. And that's not an unreal um, fear, actually. In the middle, there's the, there's the very real fear that the use of AI technology is going to create false information that is so good that we can't tell it from real information and that's going to do real damage. And the bad guys are going to do what they're going to do no matter what we might do in terms of laws and regulations. And that's a very real fear. But on the very lowest level for mediators, arbitrators, and, and lawyers, uh, there's the fear that it's going to put people out of work, that the AI is going to take over the uh, the day to day functions that a lot of people who are doing practice in various areas are engaged in, and that's a very real short term fear. Uh, what I find interesting is um, there have been a lot of calls for regulation, and a lot of calls for uh, creating so called uh, guardrails around AI, um, which is a good idea, um, but most of them have been geared toward de jure approaches. That is. Uh, legal approaches in various jurisdictions. And generally speaking, I mean, from my point of view, that doesn't work. Um, what is honored in one place may not be honored in another place. Um, it's very difficult to create uh, a legal approach, a de jure approach that crosses borders, because one thing we do know is that the current practice of arbitration, mediation, and the law cross borders all the time. Um, and so I'm an advocate of approaching all of this from a standards point of view. Uh, and the reason I do that is because people use standards not because they have to, but because they work. Um, and so you take ISO, for example. If I'm, um, if I'm looking at a product and it is, uh, has an ISO uh, designation, what that tells me is that the people who made that product made it to a certain set of standards that I can go look up, that I can understand, and then get reviewed every now and then to make sure that they're current. Uh, if we could approach the notion of AI for the law and for other types of dispute resolution as a standards issue and create standards that are workable and that people want to adhere to, the bad guys are going to do what they do no matter what. Uh, they're going to be out there uh, you know, no matter what can we do in the way of law or standards. But if we talk about this in terms of best practices and standards that we can agree on and that people can say, oh, okay, I'm going to use those, I'm going to create to those, what it basically does is it creates an economic incentive for people who are creating AI to be responsible. So if I'm a court system or I'm a lawyer or I'm a mediator and my organizations say, okay, we will buy your product and we will use your product if you create it to these set of standards that we think are 
um, within best practices. If you don't do that, we won't buy your product. We won't use it. And I think one of the things that's undoubtedly, uh, undoubtedly coming along is that we are going to see not just chat GPT and some of the other large scale generative AI. We're going to see a whole bunch more very targeted AI for very narrow uh, pieces of the law and mediation and arbitration practice. And that's where the rubber is going to meet the road in the short term for practitioners. So that's a, it's a long way of saying standards is the way I think we ought to go. I sort of think that the, uh, I, I think the standards thing is important. And I think one of the standards that I, I as a long-term technology use person, I uh, have been using technology since 1970 uh, and have grown as, and have grown with the technology. And my own sense is that Technology, the current uh, AI, that is one, garbage in, garbage out. And so people will have to be responsible for, for checking stuff that, 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 that you can use it, but you can't just use it without. It's going to change the nature of a lawyer's work, the nature of a doctor's work, that the doctor, it's not its not gonna be a substitute for a doctor or a lawyer. It's just going to mean that the nature of how lawyers work. I love it. I, I, I am using it to help me draft stuff and I really see the benefit of it, but I also see the uh, problem with it. And one of the most significant problems is built in racism that, uh, that we tend to think that if something is race neutral, that it's not racist. And we tend to forget that AI is just people's programming and they program in their biases. Well, and they use their biases are based on their, their programming is based on bias databases. And, uh, and so when you ask, uh, you know, AI to generate a list of authors who, uh, uh, and in some way, that it's, they're, the bias for white authors is going to show up because the database is biased. And, 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 and there has to be a way to address that issue. And I'm not sure sure how you do that um but i think this i think i like the standard thing by saying that you're you you know it has to be proven not to have a racial bias in the areas that you're working in well i think that's exactly right and one of the reasons that i that i really am a standards kind of, of approach would take the standards approach is that one of the standards that I that I wrote, I helped write the standards that are out there for online dispute resolution that the ABA uses, that ISO is going to use, that the National Center uses. That one of those is transparency. The thing about uh, AI and, and any of the other things that we're talking about is that the data set is the important driver. I, I hate to use the term simple, but the programming is not all that difficult. The programming has been around for a long time. It's the availability and the access to the huge databases, the huge data sets that are themselves biased. Um, and I could give you all sorts of examples, but you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so one of the things that I would suggest is that one of the standards that we think about is transparency of the data set. Because if, if the data set is corrupted, if the data set is unknown, if it's a black box, so to speak, then, then we're at the mercy of that data set. But if, we, but if the developers are transparent about the data set they're using, they're transparent about how they choose the information that the, the AI learns from, then that moves us in a direction that gives us a little bit of control about what we're using. Uh, I know that you're familiar with the, uh, the, in fact, the poor lawyer who's in front of the judge today uh, being, um, um, uh -huh. assessing his penalty for using uh, chat GPT without checking out the sources. Well, you know, that's one example. That I'll give you another example, then I'll shut up uh, for a while. Um, in Virginia, uh, there was a, um, 
Well, let me let me back up and say that we've been using something we've called AI for a long time. A uh, very simple AI in a bounded universe. It started out in e-commerce, where uh, you know there are very few things that can go wrong. Uh, I didn't get it. It wasn't what you said it was. It was broken when I got it, etc. Very few things I can do to fix it. I can give you a new one. I can give you your money back. I can give you a replacement. So in that bounded universe, you can set up a decision tree that asks the consumer what happened, and they tell you within a certain range. Are you satisfied if we do this and give them an option in a certain range and boom, you don't have to have a human being involved at all. We've been doing that for a long time. What's different now is that we're moving into an unbounded universe, or at least in my opinion, an unbounded universe. There are there are laws and there are procedures, but there are also something in decision theory called equifinality, that there's a, many ways to get to an acceptable solution. And so we're operating with AI now in a, in a universe where it's there are so many options. You have to be very careful about the data set you give it. The example I was going to use in Virginia is that there was a sentencing program that was optional for judges, and basically it took in information about the person who was, who'd been convicted, and the judge could choose to use or not use the suggested sentencing that the uh, system came back with. Well, in one sense, you can't fault the program because what they did was they took historical data and they accurately fed that historical data in. The problem is that historical data is extremely biased. And so what happens is that there was a, a study asking whether the judges who didn't use that program were more biased than the judges who did use the program. And, the, and not surprising to me, the judges who ignored the program were less biased than the judges who used the program because the, the program itself was based on a bad data set, on a biased data set. That's what we have to protect against. You know, I think one of the things, I think that's an excellent point. I think one of the things that we, in terms of the law, our opinions are structured, the, the legal opinions in which we base our decision-making on is structured around time when writing and book print was expensive. And, and so I think, for instance, I believe that we would have better legal outcomes if fuller facts were included in opinions. If uh, that, that the opinions right now, and they may be moving towards this, but opinions are structured around the judge. The judge decides what opinions are relevant and the opinions are structured around that. Well, that means a bias creeps in. Uh, uh, if the judge doesn't think race is relevant, then race is not mentioned. And so that you can't really do an evaluation of how race is impacting decisions because so many cases don't even mention race. Uh, I think that one of the things that having a, a, a broad, broader database will, that could help is if we say, look, you don't, don't all facts go in. You know, and then you, you, then you underneath that pick out the facts in your opinion that uh, is relevant to how you make the decision. I think that that would help uh, researchers and people like myself to be able to go into databases and make an evaluation of how a particular characteristic. It's always frustrated me in law school that the only time race would be mentioned is in some very limited uh, cases and that you couldn't really tell uh, how the race of the judge, the race of the uh, attorneys, defendants, plaintiffs was affecting the outcome because none of that information was in the database. And so you, because it's not in the database, when you get to AI, and AI uh, is based on those databases and someone acts to generate 
an analysis of the impact of race in the law in a certain area, it's going to come back, you know, skewed in some kind of way because of the way those opinions are are written. I think that those kinds of things will have to change and lawyers, lawyers and judges and the legal system will need to take account of race and gender, sexual orientation and religion uh, much more than it has in the past in the so, reporting. Yeah, I, I so let, me, yeah, let me let me ask you all both a question about that. Is that I, I see you all kind of talking to the 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 construction of the type of AI that is there, and the, and I I see how standards can can work and 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 the ideas that you're both making on that. One of the things I was wondering about, what about the market for the AI? Like if there are a hundred products out there, are, are there certain ones that will generate certain kinds of responses that will be more quote unquote popular if, if and end up becoming the de facto standard, you know? Uh, well, that's, what do you think? that's why I, that's why I am a standards advocate because it, I would correct your language a little bit. Yeah. If it's here in the marketplace and it becomes the dominant theme in the marketplace, it doesn't mean that it's that it's standard. What it means is it's popular. But okay. so if we, if we co construct a standards approach to creation of AI databases and data sets that is transparent, that is all the other stuff that we might want to put in there, then, then that gives us a basis on which to choose which of those uh, programs we're going to use. Um, and so it's it's and I think to to the point that was being made before, there's a new skill that is coming down the pike that's going to be very important. It's it's already exists, but it's going to become even more important. When you create a good database, a good data set that actually represents uh, it, it fairly and equally the, the universal stuff that's out there, that's a huge data set in the law. It's an enormous. Mm. And so the way you ask the question of the AI is extremely important and not very long from now in law schools you're going to find people are going to be teaching how to ask the ai a question that is an appropriate question because that's going to help you get back the information that's going to be useful to you that is going to uh, either not eliminate bias but it's going to at least put a, shine a spotlight on bias and, and allow you to deal with that information in a way we couldn't deal with it before and so well, i think yeah. ai has i mean the ai is we're talking about it is not any really different than the research skills, uh, internet research skills that you, we've needed, Westlaw research skills that you needed. You know, you if you don't ask the right question, you don't get the right information back. Uh, and 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 law schools have not been that good about teaching. I think they may have gotten better. I retired ten years ago, so I'm not sure what's happening in law schools anymore. But I know when I went to law school, the whole idea of using uh, inter a database, uh, um, I mean, Westlaw and Lexis, but that teaching the research skills necessary to use those kind of databases uh, was not a high priority. Yeah, no. I, I don't know. I, I, it, uh, I, I was going to say, uh, I feel like the person who learned the horse and buggy approach to doing research with uh, these little booklets called shepherdizing things and all that, as opposed to the kinds of technologies that people, uh, you know, use with these these technologies that are there today, and so. If I could say something, I've heard from you is kind of garbage in and garbage out on the data sets. Then I'm hearing garbage question in, garbage answer out as yeah. being what, you know, is kind of in this. And so there's like this package of things that have to be developed as skills, including having the standards to, to really do this right, if I could say it like that. So the, to move from our technology to the technology part of our discussion, so there's there's a risk for some trick technology being in here, 
And so, to explain to me what you mean by technology. I'm not sure I understand well, that. What I'm trying to get at is that, you know, some of those issues like misinformation happening and people believing things that are not true because the question has been put in a certain way as opposed to another. It be, it's the use of the technology to kind of trick people, okay, to a certain extent. And that made me think uh, to go along to some of the ways the law gets used to kind of trick people. And um, you, we were talking before about this case down in Florida that's just come up with the, what is it the stand your ground rules down there? Or maybe you yeah, can tell us a little just, more about it. The stand your ground, uh, I mean, it's been maybe 20 years or so that since uh, uh, states have been, and almost 30 states have passed some form of stand your ground rule, a se self-defense rule that basically says that you can use deadly force and you don't have to retreat if you reasonably believe that your life is in danger. Now, the problem with stand your ground laws is the, um, many states adopt what a subject idea of reasonable belief, meaning that it the the person just has to believe it. And on some level, it's reasonable for them to believe it, even if it's not factually true. So they have to believe that they're going to be hurt. And if, even if it's not factually true, this, from their point of view, it was reasonable. The objective mm. standard is that it goes to the reasonable person. You don't look at what the individual in the situation believe. You look at what the reasonable person believe. Down here in Florida, Florida, we have not only a subjective standard uh, so that uh, the, but we have a, the law has been modified to put the burden of proof on the sheriff. Mm. Uh, so, so you can't, so the typical thing is somebody shoots somebody, they claim it was self-defense, they get arrested, they get to use their defense in trial. So whether that defense is self-defense or stand your ground. Okay. Well, so if I'm trying to imagine somebody knocks on a door and it's the wrong door, I, I got to think that the uh, the daughter door salesperson business may not be a very good business down there in Florida. I mean, well, I, it might not be because, well, the, the, what happened with the, the, a neighbor shot through a closed door and, the, and everybody, I was upset because there wasn't an immediate arrest. But what they didn't understand is, by law, there could not be an, an immediate arrest. Mm. That 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 once someone says that they were standing their ground, then the sheriff has to collect enough facts to say that. You, that shooting was not justified, oh. and, and 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 what happens is, and what has happened is, is over the years, disproportionately black and brown, and Asian and Native people who try to use stand your ground can't use it because mm. the sh because they say, wait a minute, your fear was not justified. Your behavior was not justified, and so no. And so then they get arrested and they go to trial, and then they they can still try to use stand your ground, but they have to go through the trial process. Okay. Uh, they did even they did ultimately uh, arrest the white woman who shot the black mother because it was a closed door, a closed metal door with no glass. And they shot through it, uh, in in that killed her. But in terms of this whole 
So the, how do you use the law? How do you research the law? How do you uh, show the how, how, how will databases, how can databases be used to change the law or, or AI, how can AI databases, because that's all I think of them as just databases that mm -hmm. can generate something for you. And you then have to use your brain power uh, to understand what's being generated, check to make sure it's proper, modify it uh, in some way. So how can that be used to do something to try to get Florida to at least go to an objective standard uh, and to take off that part about the sheriff not being able to arrest someone. Uh, do you think that that kind of uh, use of AI technologies, like a statistical type stuff, could be a, a help thing in this kind of setting to improve the law, not make it tricky, but make it actually more... Well, one, one of the ways that I think, and it, it, okay. it does, this is good. One of the ways that I think, like, I think that uh, progressive people are not as aggressive about generating bills to get uh, and using, well, I don't know what I'm saying, that was not enough information. Uh, I think that it could be used to generate bills in a way, language for bills that could then be used by organizations to introduce and that the, the work that is take to generate a bill is so enormous that nonprofits can't often do that because they don't have, they are working in a way that they don't have the financial backing and they don't have the manpower. It seems to me that AI could do that. And someone would obviously, I mean, this is why I say work will change. You couldn't take that and give it to someone. You should not take something, but it's a draft that then could be used by someone, uh, a volunteer lawyer, or someone to uh, to go forth from that. So uh, yeah, I think, I think that's the one way that AI could be used. I think that a good database showing uh, statewide, I mean, and this is already uh, can be used uh, to show state how, statewide who's being arrested, who's being charged, uh, who's not being charged, uh, and uh, what's the circumstances under which they are being charged and not being charged. Oh, okay. And any final thoughts, Daniel? Uh, and just a couple of very quick things. I know we're running out of time. But one is that, that if you if you talk about using an AI program, well, the question, one of the assertions that's been made about the technology and, and uh, justice for a long time is that the use of technology in, um, will increase access to justice. And my response to that has always been, well, maybe it could, um, but it also could cause problems. Um, if, if, for example, using this uh, stand your ground example, uh, if I simply took the information that we have already in cases everywhere, you know, millions of them, as many as you want to throw in there, about how stand your ground cases have been handled, I, all I'm doing is I'm building in the biases we've already got. So I've got to find some way to ameliorate that problem. And exactly. so if I do that, am I getting access to justice? I don't think so. I'm getting access to a version of what we've already had. And so as we go forward, as we look at those applications, that AI that we're going to want to use in the law or anywhere else, this whole notion of how transparent it is, how they're building the data sets, and how they're allowing the AI to manipulate the data sets is absolutely key. Because if we do nothing but build big data sets, we're going to build big biased data sets. We have to do something.
No, I agree. And even if we build non-biased data sets, we have a racist system. And, and, and to some extent, AI doesn't eliminate those systems uh, that they operate. They operate within a system. Right. And, and I agree with that. So we have uh, come come to the end of another interesting sessions where uh, we we see uh, on the one hand the possibilities of this technologies, but the worries about it, and uh, ways that we can try to adjust that uh, what what the technology brings out to actually work towards access to justice, even if we question the system in which the uh, results are coming out in. So. One more stimulating moment in the rule of law in the new abnormal. I thank you, uh, Professor Randall. Thank you, uh, Daniel Rainey, for uh, joining us today. And I thank those who are watching this for joining us today. And uh, we wish you all uh, good Godspeed. I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia, so I don't know if I should say mahalo, but I'm going to say mahalo anyway to you folks out there in Hawaii.